Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode 75 of the On Air Advocate, where at the On Air Advocate, we look to provide education, support, and empowerment for all of those with different abilities, mental and medical illnesses, and their caregivers. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Tammy Flynn, and I am the host and producer of the On Air Advocate, and I am super excited that you are tuning in this Sunday evening to hear us or whether you are catching this on the replay. Now, as you all know, at the On Air Advocate, usually every week or two weeks, we pick a focus. And so this past week, we have been focusing on Childhood Cancer Awareness because September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. And so with that, I am so happy to have one of my friends here, as well as she is a mother, a wife, a nurse practitioner, and a childhood cancer advocate, Anna Guerrero. Hi, Hi, everybody. (laughs) I am so happy that you are here this evening um, for you to be able to share with everybody your journey and your family story um, dealing with childhood cancer and I know your son Manny having leukemia. Yes, Um, he's currently 10 years old now, um, but he was diagnosed at the age of three. Um, And as I mentioned to you, Tammy, we kind of find out, we found out by accident um, he went through to a regular doctor visit and had a checkup and iron level was low, which was not unusual for him. So we did supplementation for about a month and then went back and I at that time was working as a nurse. So my husband had to take him in and, um, he's like, well, they're sending me to children's and I'm not sure why. And me being the nosy nurse I am, I looked it up and right away kind of knew something was wrong. Um, within an hour of him leaving the hospital, we got the call. Um, saying that we had to go immediately to the doctor's office. And then from there, she walked in. She looked at us. We cried. She cried. Asked her, you know, is it cancer? She said, yes, I'm sorry. I've already talked to an oncologist at Children's. I need you guys to go home, pack a bag, and you're going to be admitted tonight. Um, That fast? That quick, yeah. Um, So our life literally changed from one moment to the other, like with the within a split second. Um, And we also had my stepson Ricardo living with us as well. So we also had to make sure he was taken care of and what were we going to do? So a lot of emotions rushing through feels like it just happened yesterday. You know, it, it never goes away, even though it's seven years later at this point. Um, So we're like, what was was that process? Like, so he was three years old at the time. Mm-hmm. I took him in for the for that blood test that day. She calls you that same day, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not even been 24 hours. No. <laughs> like like you got home and you went back. Right. Um, immediately. And so once you got to, it was at Children's Hospital, obviously, right? Correct. In Wisconsin. Uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Uh, once you got to Children's then, what was that beginning process like? I mean, so you're there, you just find this out. They call these doctors in that they start running additional tests. What happened in, in those moments for you guys, aside, aside from being like, I can't believe this? Extremely overwhelming. I mean, how do you explain to a three-year-old what's going on? And we were taken into a hospital room. He's like, okay, I've never been in a hospital ever. He'd been healthy. So it was a little overwhelming for him. He was very scared. We were scared. We were trying not to show him that overwhelming emotion we were having. Doctors, nurses, here's a book. Here's a binder. Here's this. This is the information. This is the test we're doing. So a lot of information all at once. And then to tell your three-year-old, okay, well, now we're going to go into this other room and the people from Flight for Life who are trained in um, putting in an IV in a young child are now going to put an IV in and you're looking at your son telling him to be brave and a small tears coming down his face trying to be brave. So that was very scary for him and for us. And when he was first admitted, how long was he there then in that very beginning? So you go to the doctor, you find out the same day, you get back to the hospital, you guys are now inpatient in the hospital. How long were you there for that first stint of time? The first stint of time was about seven, eight days. Oh my gosh. Okay. And that was mostly to do additional tests. They had to test his... um, his um, spinal fluid to see what type of leukemia he had. They knew he had leukemia, but they didn't know the type nor the subtype. So they had more and they had to initiate treatment immediately. 
Okay, now, so for leukemia, how many different types of leukemia can there be? And are there some that are more aggressive than others? Yes, there are. There's ALL, which is what Manny had, and he had B cell, which you can also have T cell, ALL, and you can have a Philadelphia chromosome, a non-Philadelphia chromosome. So the more you get into it, the worse it can be. And there's also AML as well, which is much more aggressive. Um, so once they did all the testing and they came back and said that Manny had ALL um, pre B cell, which was his official diagnosis, they pretty much said that's the best leukemia you could have if you had to have leukemia. So his chances of living and doing well were great. Okay. And especially because he fell within the age range. Um, so okay. as a teenager, uh, the, they're very much more higher risk and, and require more treatments and more um, chances of relapse. Okay, when he becomes a teenager, or meaning if he would have acquired it when he if was he a teenager? he would have acquired it as a teenager, yeah. Okay, and so you're in, you find this out, so, you know, you find out that it's the best form of leukemia that really probably doesn't change as a parent, your no. parents <laughs> inside of you, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, your child being scared and all of that. What were those next steps that kind of took place after that? So what is that succession that happens, you know, once you guys are discharged? Was it something that was in every day going back to the hospital? Was it once a week? It was once to twice a week, typically, but we also had oral medications we had to administer to him at mm -hmm. home which was another process, what three-year-old knows how to take a pill. Right. Um, so we had to crush and experiment with putting it in um, different types of syrups and juices to get him to take it and pull it up in a syringe. So he was on steroids every day for a whole month. And on top of that, he was on different chemos that we had to give him quite often. And then he'd have to go back to the hospital for intravenous chemo as well. Um, and have a pick line placed in his arm because it was too soon to do the port in his chest. Um, so that was a process. So he blew up like a balloon after all those steroids. And, right. and actually like on, uh, before we left the hospital, they do another, they check his spinal fluid again to see if now he is, um, there's no longer any sign of disease per se that they can detect in a um, microscope. Okay. Um, so and he still had it. So that put him in a higher risk category. So then on day 29, which was after, the, the goal is remission immediately. So day 29, they did it again. And thankfully, there was no more. Otherwise, that would have even more increased the risk of, of treatment and required longer treatments. So on day 29, it did show, okay, there's no um, residual disease that we see under the microscope. But through years and years of research, they know that for, for kids his age, they have to treat two and a half years of treatment from remission. So it doesn't mean he's out of the woods. It means if you don't treat for this amount of time, the risk of it coming back is very high. Okay. Um, and for boys, they have to go a whole year longer. So he was in treatment for three and a half years after that. Okay, so even once you guys had went through all the heavy chemo and stuff, you still were doing treatments for three and a half years preceding that. Of and heavy I, chemo. Continuously. Of heavy chemo, yes. And I remember I was at the No More Chemo party for me. Yes, that's where we met. <laughs> that's where we met each other. <laughs> and so how old was he at that time? He was six and a half. He was six and a half years old. Okay, and since then, all of your checkups have been all clear. Yes. Thankfully. <laughs> and is there anything besides the yearly checkups that you guys do or that doctors tell you to watch for within this process or different checkups that, you know, go along with it? Sure. Um, with boys, they really have to watch the boy private part, the testes um, mm -hmm. due to leukemia likes to come back in that area for boys. So that's why the boys have to go a whole year longer of treatment. Okay. Um, at the end of that month, when Mammy, Manny was first treated, he actually developed a, a very deadly leg infection, which we thought was a um, ear infection because he was having a fever. But turns out steroids actually mask fever. So he started burning up. He had already, that fever was already festering and festering and finally was showing itself. And then it took doctors a few days to figure that out, but he had four masses in his legs that 
were of bacteria that he could have contracted anywhere because his immune system was completely gone because that was, we got to clean everything. Mm -hmm. And um, he almost died. He was septic and he had to learn how to walk again. And so he still has some leg and foot issues to this day. Um, so he currently see, he does see um, an, or um, he sees a doctor, a specialist for his feet. He has to wear all these special things in his shoes, um, like orthotics, um, trying to play soccer stuff. again now. So he needs ankle mm -hmm. stability. It's, it's a, a lot, a lot of these drugs do a lot of bad things to their bones and muscles. Right. And when did that happen? And when he was out of the woods, like when he was through his yep. on day one, after that day 29, when he first, when he got into remission, because pretty much they're cleaning out the entire system mm -hmm. to get him into remission. And then their counts start to kind of build back up here and there, and then you continue treatment. So after that first month of treatment, he developed this leg infection. So it was, um, any, a bug that, would not do anything to us, but to him, it almost killed him. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that you're dealing with for forever now, kind of some of the repercussions. I mean, you've cleared up the infections, but some of the, um, the aftermath of, you know, with his feet and stuff like that, yeah. injury to some yeah. of the muscles. I mean, relatively, he's healthy now. And I'm, I thank God every day that he's still here. Um, but we, we do see some of the aftermaths and he has to have his heart checked up every five years because of a, one of the meds that he got can be toxic to the heart. Um, some of the meds can cause neuropathy, which he did have um, before treatment ended. That's gone. But again, you know, he's severely flat footed now and he's had fractures in his feet. Um, so hypothetically, they, they feel obviously the cancer treatment had something to do with it. Then right. on top of it, he had chemo into his spine injected 26 times every month of treatment um, in order to treat the central nervous system because that's a separate treatment. It's not in the same bloodline that regular chemos are treating. Right. So he, he shows some hyperactivity and ADHD becomes an issue. And now there's research showing that kids are developing um, attention deficit at the longer they're off treatment due to these treatments that went into their central nervous system. So we're constantly waiting and watching and is mm -hmm. something else going to come back, you know? Right. But thankful for where things are at though, currently yeah. right now um, with that whole fight. Now, I know we kind of talked a little bit off the air and I really think that so much of the time when we're going through um, all of these things, all different complex medical health conditions, and we're in the hospital and it's mom and dad, not only does there become, you know, a whole different triangle between mom, dad, and child that's sick and a whole different relationship because um, you're kind of in crisis mode, yes. but I always think to myself, you know, your, your outside family, your sibling, you know, the, the siblings, what happens there? And would there be any advice that you could lend to any others that may be going through, whether it be with their, you know, young adult or child complex, you know, medical issues, lots of hospital stays, lots of visits, you know, for those other, you know, the siblings, you know, your spouse, all of that. Yeah. Um, well, we went, the first visit in the clinic after Manny was out of admission, the, the nurse practitioner said, just so you know, 90 to 95% of parents end up divorced after something like this. Mm -hmm. So my husband and I were like, okay, <laughs> oh, now this is going to be interesting what's going to happen here. But mm -hmm. he, we, we equaled each other out. He was strong where I needed him to be strong, and I was strong where he needed me strong and he looked to me as the professional like hey you're a nurse you know what you're doing I need you to guide me and then right. when I was weak he was there for me um, but it it definitely does cause some issues um, we had a lot of long night talks of hey what are we doing you know um, we've had talks of do, you, do we need to go to therapy and make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and ourselves as a couple mm -hmm. so for me I guess looking back and I wish I would have done more self-care, mm -hmm. um, taking on the role of trying to be mom, wife, and everything else was hard. Mm -hmm. And then also, Ricardo was living with us, as I mentioned, it's, he's my stepson. Um, he feels left, he felt left out too. And, you know, 
it, it's very hurtful thinking like, wow, you know, okay, he was there for his brother no matter what. And he put right. Manny first all the time. Um, but that was hard. You know, he sometimes would want to just have, can I come sleep over at the hospital with you guys instead of, um, I'd come, <laughs> I'd be off of work and go and get Ricardo, cook him dinner, go relieve Epi from the hospital. He would come home and shower and I would stay with Manny. And then I would go home because I'd have to work the next day because Epi had to quit his job to be Manny's full-time caregiver. So mm -hmm. it was a lot of stress, you know, and you feel bad. Like Ricardo probably felt left out a lot of the time, but we tried our best to try to include him. And um, later on, we came across One Step Camp, which is phenomenal. And they do family camp. They do camp for kids on treatment and off treatment to try to normalize life for them somehow but they also do sibling camp where it's just the siblings so they understand the focus has to be there for everybody um so i guess the biggest thing is self-care individually and doing things okay if the siblings feeling left out one parent stay with the child that's ill the other parent go and do something fun i had right. my husband take him to a monster truck show or take him to go-karting before just to get him out of the house, get him doing things. And don't forget that they need the attention too. It's really easy to get wrapped up in the child that's sick at the moment, but we have to think of ourselves as well and the other people that we care for. Right. And that's such a huge thing we talk about on this show all the time is self-care because you can't take care of anyone if you're not taking care of yourself. Absolutely. But being a mom who has spent hundreds of days and times and walked through those doors of the hospital a whole lot, I can tell yeah. you it's, it's not an easy thing, you know, to, to walk away from your child um, or even if it's your elderly loved one that's sick and say, okay, I'm going to take this time for me, but something that is definitely so needed. Um, Absolutely. Now, what I know from all of the, you know, from knowing you for the last couple of years, but then some of the stories that I've already posted, and there's even more, your whole entire family, what I love is you have turned, you know, this tragic moment within your life into really a triumph and really inspiring others and really spokespeople for, you know, children, children with childhood cancer and advocating for them. And so I just think that that's amazing and wonderful and wanted you to kind of share with others how you guys got involved. Because I think sometimes turning our pain into purpose does help a lot, you know, through the pain that we go through, you know, being able to passionately then share that with other people helps so much. So how did you guys get involved with all of these organizations? Sure. No. Um, so initially it began with, um, treatment was about to end and we were starting to prep Manny like, Hey, you're not going to be coming to clinic as much anymore. Mm -hmm. He became extremely depressed. Um, he at six years old is saying, well, I'm not going to be the same person without cancer anymore. Mama, what am I going to do? Those are my friends. He, this became his identity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we were talking like, how do we, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And then Mac, we started getting involved with Mac fund with your events and started mm -hmm. seeing what else is out there. So then slowly, but surely all these different organizations started reaching out to us and we just started doing this ad advocating. And then we would reach out to organizations and see, is there anything we can do? And um, again, like you mentioned, we did the no more, no more chemo party. So I'm like, all right, perfect example of let's show Manny, how to give back, how to turn this into a positive. Like, it's okay that treatment's ending. You shouldn't be sad. You should be happy. They don't right. have to take these deadly dro toxic drugs anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so we did a lot of talking with Manny. And then he was like, yeah, I want to bring awareness. I want this to change. I don't want kids to be in treatment this long. You're right. So taking that on and then it kind of just engulfed our family. And it's just kind of, it became our, our identity after consistently doing different events. And have you seen within not only yourself, but within Manny, his, you know, his sibling, your husband, have you seen that it really has embraced everybody well? Like it really has brought in such a positive. Oh yes, feel. absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, um, Ricardo initially used to be so shy. Manny would be so shy. My husband well, I kind of wish I, but my husband <laughs> wished I too. Um, but it's really the passion of it kind of engulfed us, as I mentioned, and 
brought us to a whole nother level and even brought us closer together as a family because we're doing this as a family as a whole because we all went through it with Manny. Um, right. Yeah, so Manny recently did a speech and he went up there all on his own and he didn't need me by his side. So, <laughs> And I'm going to post that afterwards. I'm going to post this into the feed. Um, he was getting, was he giving the speech or he was getting an award, wasn't he? Um, no, he didn't get the award, but the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, they sponsor um, multiple different events, but it's for leukemia and lymphoma for all ages. So they reached okay. out to us and they asked if um, they choose a boy and girl of the year to kind of support men and women who are going on this mission of trying to raise funds and whoever raises the most, which they don't know until the night of the gala, um, ends up being told that they're the man and woman of the year based on who raises the most. So they're there, the boy and girl of the year, they're to support. Um, they are expected to do a speech. So he did multiple small ones. And then at the end this year in May, he did his big final speech and it was phenomenal. It was, I was crying. Listen, to oh. <laughs> I cry every time I heard it. So, <laughs> um, so we'll drop that below. And if anyone, you know, hopped on tonight or they're catching this on the replay and they're thinking to themselves, there is so much more I want to do because something we didn't touch base on. Do you have any statistics before we get into how other people can get involved? Yes. Um, so something that always has stood out to me and something that's like really stuck in Manny's head. So if you ever talk to him, he'll, he'll pull the stat out for you. Um, that 4% of federal government research funding goes to pediatric cancer. That is it. So all of these little organizations, even though they seem little, they are much smaller than the federal government, obviously, but they do so much volunteer work and legwork to try to raise money. Mm -hmm. There's tree, Trees of Hope, there's the MAC Fund, there's Alex's Lemonade Stand, who we work through Northwestern Mutual with, um, and then there's LLS, but they don't, it doesn't go directly to childhood cancer per se, but it goes towards the blood cancers. So there, and there's tons and tons of others that, that really try, and Manny recently right. participated in a kickball event that they do yearly. Um, where they're raising fun, funds as well. So a lot of fun things, a lot of serious things. Um, you also um, have done your Evening of Elegance mm -hmm. before, Tammy, and that's an awesome event as well. Um, but all these little things, because government isn't giving us enough to find safer treatments. I mean, there's only been, I think they said, four drugs that have been approved specifically for childhood cancer since 1980. Right. So they're getting drugs that are approved for adults, obviously in smaller doses. Um, cancer is the number one cause of death for children. Leukemia or leukemia and lymphoma being one of the top ones, blood cancers. Um, 95% 95, 95 of survivors will have health-related issues by the time they're 45 because of all the toxic chemicals they have to put in their body. The average cost of hospital stay is $40,000 for a child with cancer. So on a quick note regarding that, as a nurse, I remember at least twice during Manny's treatment, to, I begged my boss to not give me a pay increase those years because any penny I would make over, they would take away the disability that was covering the 20% that my insurance didn't cover. Right. So I, we were living paycheck to paycheck and I didn't mm -hmm. want to raise because Having that 20% of Manny's coverage covered to me was more important than being able to have an extra hundred dollars on my check. Right. And that's so. a whole nother episode that we could do on when you have, you know, children with special health conditions. Oh, yes. And how you figure that out, that equation is something very special all in itself. I know. So, I mean, like, yeah, the cost of it is ridiculous. Um, the, uh, the, the treatments in itself are ridiculous, but the cost of those treatments are ridiculous. So it just goes on and on. And, you know, it's sad that even they say that 12% of kids that are diagnosed with cancer won't survive. So Manny has had to go through losses. He has seen and heard of kids passing away. Right. Um, he goes to camp for two weeks every summer through One Step Camp, who is phenomenal, phenomenal organization. If you have a child with ki child with cancer, you, you need to send your kid there. Um, they raise funds all year long so that kids can go there for free without charge. Um, and they have nurses to administer medications. 
Um, so that's phenomenal. But he, he's met so many friends and gotten close to so many people there. So it's sad. You know, you don't see a kid there the next summer. Are they okay? Um, nope. So it has a relapse. So those are losses, but he's also building tons of friendships. So it, it, it's, it's sad, but this gives him more of a goal to keep going. And he, his goal, he told me just last week is to change that 4% and government should be giving more. <laughs> <laughs> right. And when you listen and think about that, okay, so um, for those, obviously, I'm an on-air advocate, but I've also done a lot of, you know, charitable fundraising. And to think that I did not know until about a year ago that I was giving money, but I didn't realize that only 4% of that is actually used to find a cure. It's crazy. And that's all of the childhood cancers. That's not 4% just used for leukemia. That's for all of them. So yeah. divide that out and maybe like 1.2% of what someone is giving, you know what I'm saying, is actually going towards it to find a cure. It's, it's unfathomable. It's one of those things this whole year I've been thinking to myself, so many things are just ridiculous. I mean, they just, in, in our world that we live in today, it shouldn't be acceptable on any right. level. You know, um, and with it being the number one, the number one killer of our children today, how can we not give them more than that? You know, it's so becoming more and more common too. I mean, back when I was a kid, I don't recall ever hearing of children with cancer as often as now. And now, almost every school has had a couple. Even you know, it's becoming much more common. At least four hundred. They said at least four hundred thousand kids are diagnosed each year of a childhood cancer. Right. Quite significant. Yeah. And as I, we spoke about that, you know, two little girls in my network, a 10 and an 11 year old girl, both passed away earlier this year in 2018, one from leukemia, the other one from DIPG. And if you go back on the On Air Advocates, um, other videos that I've done, I think it was around episode 10, um, I hammered into DIPG for about two weeks and we had some guests on with that. And that again, um, you know, it's, it's for all of it. You know what I'm saying? For all of the cancers, we need more is really yes. the bottom line is like, it's not, it's not okay. And we need more. So Anna, if people want to get involved and they want to do more and they want to give back, whether that be partaking in an event like a walk or, you know, a, a gala event that way, but they maybe don't live in Wisconsin, you know, we're here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we're talking about this. Where could they possibly reach out to, to find more information? Um, there are a ton of organizations, but Alex's Lemonade Stand is one that's known nationally. Um, mm -hmm. Leukemia Lymphoma Society is all over, but they're, they're not just fo solely focused on childhood cancer. Um, MAC Fund in Wisconsin will take whatever donations from anywhere. It doesn't matter because we do get people from all around every state. Right. Um, we get lots of people. They're, they're becoming just as famous as St. Jude's, unfortunately. Um, and there, there are other organizations. Um, just look up what's in your local area and help them out or anything national, anything national that's a childhood cancer okay. organization. Um, or reach out to me if you need to. That's fine. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. So if you need some other resources, you definitely can drop below this Facebook Live, just a little comment and, you know, Anna can get back to you and get some resources that way, or I can also help you. We are going to drop some of the other organizations like Alex's Lemonade Stand and what below this live, um, just so it's easy and accessible for all of you. Um, but anything else you'd like to leave us with tonight, Anna? Um, whatever you can do, if there's a, if there's a child in your class that, that has, or in your child's class that has cancer, or if it's a, an adult that, whose child has cancer, just try mm -hmm. to be supportive, um, be understanding, don't be that person that says, if you need anything, let me know, and then you kind of run the other way, um, because, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard for us to ask for help. Um, it's more of the, the giving that we have noticed in these organizations that has like really opened up our hearts. Um, and you, you would not expect that people would be so giving, but they are, and it's okay to allow them to give. Um, and don't be afraid to give to certain organizations. I know sometimes we're kind of a little bit more weary about, mm -hmm. is the money really going to that place? Just do your research and see if they're legit, if they're a .org, generally they're legit and the money is going to go to that place. Um, participate right. in whatever you can in your local areas and 
support these kiddos. <laughs> Try to make September known as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month because that's our big goal right now. Um, getting the NFL wearing gold would be awesome. Wisconsin Badgers are already yes. wearing gold on their helmets. Miller Park went gold um, just for their cancer night on September 15th. Um, we have license plates out there now. So um, help us get the word out. Help us whatever way you can. We will do. We will do. And all of those, when people purchase those, money goes back, right? Like if you purchase yep. the license plates and all Absolutely. of that. And, all yep. right. So there's a zillion ways to get involved um, with any of this. We're going to drop all of the stuff below. I thank you guys for tuning in this Sunday late evening. And unfortunately in Wisconsin, the Packers didn't win today. So I'm very oh. sorry. They went gold, but they didn't, they didn't win, but we won today on our show. So with that, um, you guys all have a fabulous week ahead. If you want any more information about the On Air Advocate or any of other other services, you can head right on over to onairadvocate.com and you will find them all right there. And then make sure to stay tuned because this next week, our focus is on alopecia awareness for our last week of September. So thank you so very much, Anna. We thank will talk you. soon. I appreciate you being here tonight. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Good night. Good night.